Good morning and welcome to our webinar, Fear of Cancer Recurrence. My name is Mary Ann Skaparis and working alongside me here today are my colleagues, Jenny Burke and Linda Thompson. And together we will be facilitating today's webinar. Before we start, um, I'd like to give an acknowledgement to country. The Leukemia Foundation acknowledges the traditional owners of the various lands we are coming together on here today. We recognise and respect First Nations people, spiritual beliefs, and their deep and continuing connection to land, sea and communities. We pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging, for they hold stories, traditions, the culture and hope for their people. In today's webinar, we'll be sharing personal stories and insights into the fear of recurrence of blood cancer and blood disorders. Fear of recurrence is one of the biggest concerns following a cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment. It is a natural and normal response to worry about cancer recurrence. Having some fear in rec of recurrence is normal, but sometimes excessive fear can lead to decreased quality of life, including problems sleeping and eating, difficulty concentrating and making decisions, and withdrawal from participating in activities that once provided joy and fulfillment. We hope that following today's webinar, that you can walk away feeling empowered by personal stories shared and strategies to help you manage these fears. As most of you joining us here today are aware, we place the patient at the heart of everything that we do. To set the scene, it gives me great pleasure to share with you a reflection from Peter, a gentleman in his 70s who has given us permission to share his story about living with acute myeloid leukaemia. Peter has undergone two bone marrow transplants and during this time, he valued the support of his beautiful wife and friends as he, friends, as he, the, as he experienced with his experiences of being an inpatient was very lonely. He believes staying connected to those that you love is really important. Taking up a hobby and immersing yourself in an activity that keeps your mind busy also helped him cope day to day. Having a laugh is good for the soul. Having a dog or a pet also gives great comfort. His greatest message is to embrace and lift the moment and to celebrate the small wins. Recognize your different milestones and try to enjoy each day to the fullest. Thank you, Peter, if you're out there listening for sharing with us your personal story. Some lovely and valuable tips on how to spend time and value each moment is really important. Many of you have shared your questions and concerns and we will be putting these to our panel at the end of their presentations. We know you will understand that we are unable to answer highly personal and specific individual questions in this forum. Before we go on, when in Zoom, you can see us, but just a reminder, we can't see you. Microphone and video functions are not available to you in such a large group, and we have over 400 people joining us here today. The chat function is working and you can add a question or comment there. But remember, we will address the pre-submitted questions first. We ask that any questions or comments that you are placing in the chat are respectful and considerate. For our first speaker today, I would like to introduce Jen. Jen has kindly agreed to share her story and will stay with us for a short part of the Q&A. Uh, Jen was diagnosed with myeloma, a condition that affects the plasma cells, just shy of her 27th birthday. Jen shares her experiences with diagnosis, treatments, relapse, and managing the fear of recurrence. Today, Jen leads a full and active life, which includes working full-time, regularly hitting the gym, and caring for her friends, family, and pets. Welcome, Jen, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Marianne, appreciate it. Um, my name is Jen and I suffer from multiple myeloma, which is an incurable blood cancer. The average age of myeloma diagnosis is 70 years and only 2% of patients are diagnosed under 40 years. I was just shy of my 27th birthday when I was diagnosed. So my fear around recurrence isn't so much will it come back, but when will it come back and how many times? It's about preparing myself for the inevitable two steps forward in life and four steps back that I feel when I'm told that I need to start chemo again. 
When I was diagnosed, I was very unwell and started treatment immediately. I felt a huge sense of relief though, as I'd been misdiagnosed for such a long time. I finally knew what I was dealing with. I went through chemotherapy and a transplant. And although it was taxing on my body, I was relieved to be getting my health and life back on track and looked forward to the future ahead. For me, the most challenging part was when I finally got home and was left to my own devices. Time seemingly stood, stood still. And all I could do was think about the spanner that diagnosis had thrown into my life plan. I could no longer have children. How do I start a new relationship and expect them to accept and understand my diagnosis? On top of that, every ache, sniffle, rash or cold filled me with dread that the illness had already relapsed. However, I was very fortunate to have enjoyed a full decade in remission. In 2020, peak COVID, my cancer markers started to rear their ugly heads again. The maybe I'm an exception to the rule bubble had burst and I'd never been able to feel complacent since. I went through the chemo and transplant rigmarole again and found the whole process much harder to grapple with. Three years on and I still find it hard to ignore that heavy cloud of uncertainty that hangs over me. I know it will come back, but when? While the treatment itself was easier to manage the second time around, it was much more taxing mentally. I remember the overwhelming sense of deflation as I could hear others ringing the last dose of chemo bell at the hospital, realizing that I personally would never be able to ring that bell. Furthermore, many of my closest friends and family members had either passed away or moved on, so I felt much more alone. Once I was released from the hospital after my second transplant, I reached out to my psychologist to help me process and compartmentalize the whole experience. Initially, I was hesitant to really live my life, changing careers, finding love, and generally diving into life seemed too risky and almost pointless. The thought of it all being taken away again and having to start over depressed and scared me. But while I'm still waiting for the relapse monster to visit again, my experiences have taught me to embrace my mantra, it is what it is. There's no point putting my energy on things that I can't control. Now I focus on my fitness, my mental health, my pets, family and friends, and on being the best version of me that I can possibly be. This has made me a much happier, more adjusted and mentally equipped to handle the next relapse and anything that life throws at me. Thanks, Jen. You're an absolutely remarkable young lady. I thank you for sharing your personal story with us here this morning. Um, I'd like to now introduce uh, Dr. Charlotte Topman. Um, Charlotte works as a clinical psycho-oncologist. She consults privately, providing psychological treatment for cancer-related distress. Charlotte works with cancer patients, their family members and carers at all stages of the cancer experience. Charlotte works closely with Breast Cancer Network Australia, is an editor for the Cancer Council of Australia and has strong links with the McGrath Foundation, Canteen, Leukaemia Foundation and Ovarian Cancer Australia. Welcome, Charlotte. Welcome to today's session. Thanks very much. It's very good to be here. Gosh, that, um, that presentation from Jen was very moving. Um, I try to stay away from the word inspirational because sometimes it comes off as a bit sort of, I don't know, I don't really like it, but it was, yeah, I'm a bit left stuck for words, Jen. That was a whole thing. Yeah, I feel like, you know, what I'm going to say is, well, it's going to match a lot of what you say, but you're like the living embodiment of a lot of what a lot of what I would be recommending. So go you. All right, I'm going to hit my share slides screen and hopefully then, oh, there we go. Right, that should be everybody seeing my slides. Um, so my name's Dr. Charlotte Topman. I'm a clinical psycho-oncologist. Um, a psycho-oncologist is just sexy language for um, a clinical psychologist who specialises in um, cancer-related distress. I've been working in this space for very many years and um, I guess another added piece to my puzzle was that sometime, some many years after becoming a psycho-oncologist, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and both my parents died and all my four grandparents died of one sort of cancer or another um, when I was in my 20s. So I do cancer. I don't do blood cancer personally, but I treat a lot of people with blood cancer. So whilst I don't have the lived experience of blood cancer, um, my lived experience is a tumour cancer, I guess I have perhaps a little understanding and I certainly have a, a really lived understanding of fear of recurrence because I have lived, I have fear of recurrence. Um, on the topic of fear of recurrence, I just want to highlight something that um, links to what Jen was saying and, and that is that 
there's fear of recurrence and there's this thing called fear of disease progression. And I guess what Jen was really referring to is, is both. And the thing about fear of recurrence and fear of disease progression is they're pretty much the same thing. There's a subtle difference between them, but the triggers are largely the same and the anxiety response that we have is largely the same. So when I'm talking about fear of recurrence, you can also think that I'm talking about fear of disease progression, which is the idea of like, not if it comes back, but when will it come back and what will that be like for me? So fear of cancer recurrence is the fear that the cancer may, may come back and that if it does, that it may threat, threaten the quality and quantity of life. So it's not just the idea that it might come back, but it's what happens if it does. Conceptually, it's a normal response to an abnormal situation. As psychologists, one of the first things that we do when we're assessing somebody is we assess whether they are having what we call a normal response to an abnormal situation or an abnormal response to an abnormal situation. My position and the position borne out in the literature around fear of recurrence, so FCR is, is what we call fear of recurrence, um, is that it would be weird if you weren't scared. I think it would be very odd if you weren't scared about the cancer coming back. And in fact, if I ever do, and it doesn't happen very often, but if I ever do have a client who says, no, nah, I'm not worried at all, that in fact is a red flag for me. So fear of recurrence is normal. And I think that sometimes within the medical community, there's a real enthusiasm to kind of get rid of fear of recurrence. And that's not a thing. We don't get to get rid of it. It's like a gift with purchase. You get handed a cancer diagnosis and at the same time you get handed fear of recurrence and you don't get to give it back. So fear of recurrence is an adaptive rational response to an existential threat. So an existential threat is a threat to your existence, yeah? If somebody's coming at you with a machete, you want to be scared. You want to do something about that. You don't just want to be like, no, I shouldn't be worried about that. So it's counterintuitive to ignore it. It's like your internal burglar alarm is going off and you're meant to pay attention to that. There's a lot of research around fear of recurrence, which is why it's got that um, acronym FCR, um, whenever I'm writing notes, that's, that's how it gets written. And in the research, there's tons and tons of, of published articles around and research around fear of recurrence. And what the findings have shown is that at least 70% of people who've had a cancer experience have fear of recurrence. And in some studies, it goes up to as high as 99%. So essentially, it's what I call a universal experience. I haven't actually met anyone who doesn't on some level have some fear of recurrence. It's really normal. It's really common. It's really unpleasant. What we see with fear of recurrence, and I think Jen referenced this just before, is that there's an increase um, of fear of recurrence during post-treatment adjustment. So post-treatment adjustment is the period that starts often at the end of hospital-based treatment. When people are in hospital, being treated, inactive treatment, having their body um, radiated or chemotherapy or immunotherapy or other things happening, often perversely, we feel a bit, a bit safe because there's kind of like active stuff going on and we feel like, well, maybe maybe not too much can happen to me. But when we go home and as Jen said, you know, you're sort of left to your own devices, that's often where we see the spike, the first spike happen. Having said that, fear of recurrence starts on diagnosis because as soon as people are diagnosed, they start thinking about, well, what are we going to do about it? Like what treatment am I going to have? But also is that treatment going to work? And how long is it going to work for? And for some people who are diagnosed in a blood cancer context with a watch and wait scenario, they're in that like fear of, well, what's going to happen when from the very beginning. So whilst we see it increase during post-treatment adjustment, the beginning of fear of recurrence is on diagnosis. There are different fear of recurrence experiences that are kind of context specific. And, and this applies I would say, to kind of all cancer situations. But in a blood cancer context, and blood cancers by reputation and statistics are more serious often than tumour cancers. The, the stats are, are scarier, if you like. Um, depending if you are in that watch and wait category, if you're in the category of being in active treatment, if you're in the category of being post-treatment and fearful of relapse, if you're in the category of experiencing a relapse, 
or having already had a relapse like Jen. There are so many different categories within the blood cancer experience. And depending on where you sit, your experience of fear of, of cancer occurrence will be a little bit different. The reason I highlight that is that at the very beginning, we are scared of the unknown. We're scared of what we don't know. Haven't, haven't been diagnosed before, don't know what's coming. But like Jen, you become expert and then you're scared of what you do know because it's not like, oh, I'm going into something that I've never really understood or I don't have any information about. It's like, oh, I know what this means. I know what's involved. I know what it was like last time. I don't know if I can do it again. And that's a really big thing. So fear of the unknown is one sort of fear and fear of the known is another sort of fear. It's not a competition. It's not about which is better or worse. It's just the fact that they're different. Fear of cancer recurrence is not specific to people who have the diagnosis. It is also something that loved ones experience. And that can be tricky because in any relationship, it is very rare, regardless of what we're talking about, it's very rare for two people to be at the same place with any one issue at exactly the same time. So sometimes when I'm scared about my fear, when I'm fearful of cancer coming back, and I'll talk to my husband, Rob, who's also a clinical psychologist, he'll be like, where, you know, where did that come from? I'm, I'm not even in that space. And likewise, he might have something trigger him and he'll come home to me and be like, oh God, it suddenly occurred to me that, you know, you might not be here in X years time. And I'll be like, oh, where did that come from? So it can set up disconnect. It can set up distance and barriers and communication around this subject is really important. But guess what? we don't do a lot of it. And the reason we don't do a lot of it is because we want to protect one another in those special relationships, whether we're the cancer patient or whether we're the carer or the, the, the partner or the family member or the friend, we tend to protect the other person. And then we go, well, I won't bring that subject up because I don't want to distress them. I don't want to take them to that place if they're not already there. And the problem with all of this stuff is it's invisible. Fear of recurrence is invisible. You can't see it. It's not like you get a nice flashing neon sign on your forehead when you're triggered. So one of the things I do encourage people to do is to talk about it. You know, give it a name. Say I have fear of recurrence. My fear of recurrence is triggered. I'm struggling with my fear of recurrence. Something happened yesterday. This made me think about what happens if it happens to me or to you. And you will be surprised to find that probably the other person in the relationship is thinking about it even more than you realised. Jen's a good example of what I call an outlier. Outliers are when it feels like the rules don't apply to you. And often outliers are younger people. Uh, sometimes they're people who've got a very rare form of blood cancer where they don't fit the kind of stereotypical picture. And it means that they are more interesting uh, and that's not a good thing. Being interesting in a cancer context isn't what we want. We want to be bog standard. We want to be garden variety. And when we're interesting, that means we're often in a more serious situation. And when you're young, the other thing about being young is apart from being an outlier is that statistically, and again, out of the research around fear of recurrence, we often see a higher degree of fear of recurrence. And the reason for that, I mean, this isn't probably that hard to understand, but if you're younger, objectively, and I'm not saying for a minute that if you're older that, that the, the potential impact on quality or quantity of life isn't huge, but if you're a lot younger, younger you've got a lot more life to lose. And, and so I think that that's one of the reasons that people who are younger struggle with fear of recurrence and that they haven't had the chance to do the things that an older person has. You know, if you're, if you're 30 versus you're 70, well, there will probably be differences around things like careers, families, life experiences, and the thought that you might not be here to experience that stuff is different than I've lived a very full life. I don't want to lose my very full life, but it is a different, objectively, it's a different scenario. 
the thing about being an outlier, and it was interesting to hear Jen talk about it, I thought, in a, in a really positive way, um, is that when the rules don't apply to you, that, that mindset, that thinking of like, well, how could this catastrophic thing happen to me? And therefore, if that could happen once, then my brain tells me, you know, what's to stop it happening again? The flip side of that is that if you're an outlier, you don't fit the model, you don't fit the mould, it does mean that a good, incredible thing could happen too. It does mean that we don't have much data on people who are outliers. So they can do something remarkable. They don't fit, they don't fit the stats as easily. It's a hard place sometimes for people to get their head in. But and I'm not trying to be Pollyanna about this stuff, but sometimes it's good to go, okay, let me let me look at both sides of the coin. If I'm an outlier, sure, that could mean something remarkable, unbelievable, bad could happen again. It could also mean the opposite. Fear of cancer recurrence experientially, so this is different to conceptually, so this is how it is when you experience it. More people experience it at a lower level a small percentage of people experience it at a very severe or high level. At a lower level, you'll be aware of it. It'll spike on occasion, and I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Um, it will be unpleasant, but it will not derail your life. At a high level, it has the potential to be really quite debilitating. And what we see in people who are experiencing very high levels of fear of recurrence is a lot of medical appointments, a lot of unscheduled medical appointments where physical symptoms are being checked, requests for scans, requests for reassurance that everything is actually okay. Lots of medical appointments, lots of time, lots of money, lots of anxiety, and therefore not a lot of time living life in a helpful, healthy way for themselves. It's a very, it can be a very debilitating experience. And because the medical model is geared around having to eliminate anything that could be problematic. That does, and it's entirely appropriate that we do that, but it does tend to fuel the fear of recurrence. Because if you go into the doctor, whether it's your existing doctor or a new doctor, and say, I've got a pain in my stomach or I've got a lump on my arm and I've got a cancer history, they're going to probably run some tests. And what does that do to the anxiety? Puts a, uh, puts a fire under it. And so the, the, the cycle continues. So for those of you who are tuned into the webinar, I would expect that most of you will experience fear of cancer occurrence at a lower level with, with spikes that feel pretty nasty and pretty high, but then are temporary and do dissipate. There may be some of you who are experiencing at a very high level where you feel that it is interrupting your life on a fairly regular basis, like I would mean a daily or weekly basis. And if you feel that that's you, then getting in touch with someone like me, like a psycho, psycho-oncologist, a, your GP, a, a psychologist, a therapist, and starting to unpack some of this stuff would be a really good thing to do. So the two things that we see most commonly behaviourally around fear of cancer occurrence are avoidance, which is staying away from things that, we, that make us feel uncomfortable, and reassurance seeking. These are anxiety behaviours, and a lot of you would be familiar with the idea of avoidance. So um, avoidance is when we don't want to think about something, talk about something, or do the something that makes us feel uncomfortable. So for some people, that will be like, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to think about cancer. I don't want to talk about cancer. In fear of recurrence, we do see probably more reassurance seeking than avoidance. But I've got to say, you know, we're all capable of both. Reassurance seeking is where we're trying to elicit from circumstances, events or others, the feeling that everything is going to be okay. So we are often asking other people, commonly our medical team, but it might be your family members, loved ones or other people around you, um, that everything's going to be okay, that, that, this, that this physical symptom I've got isn't a sign of, um, of the cancer coming back or progressing. The problem with reassurance seeking is it's like a drug. The more that you have it, the more that you want it. When you get a nice little bit of reassurance, it's like you get a light, nice little burst of relief inside and it, it feels good and your brain relaxes momentarily. And then it goes, ooh, 
I like that. I'd like a bit more of that. And so whereas at the beginning, say, and reassurance seeking comes a lot in the form of blood requests for blood tests or scans. That's how it presents in fear of recurrence often, not, not just that, but often those things in a medical context. And what we often see is whereas someone might say, oh, I'd like a scan or a blood test every year, it then becomes actually I need it every six months and then maybe I need it every four months and actually now I need it every month. Now, a lot of people living with blood cancer actually do have pretty regular blood tests and sometimes scans as well. So they are getting, if you like, you know, an inbuilt dose of reassurance. And I'm completely okay with that. It's when we actually are the ones initiating additional reassurance from our medical team that it might be a sign that it's being psychologically driven rather than medically driven. There are six main triggers for fear of cancer occurrence or disease progression, yeah? And in no particular order, they are diagnosis. So like I said before, when you're first diagnosed, that's when fear of cancer occurrence starts. Medical reviews. So any time that you have to have your scheduled medical review, it's like your brain seems to have a little calendar that's on a um, automatic mechanism. And usually about two weeks out, it seems like our brain starts a little bit of a countdown. And most people will report feeling a little bit more anxious. And often that comes out behaviorally as be, being a little bit scratchy. So a little bit, perhaps a little bit harder to live with, a little bit short tempered or a little bit more reactive. And so that can be really helpful to, to plug in your loved ones, your family members to sort of understand that, you know, whenever I've got a medical review coming up, I am probably going to be a little bit harder to live with. And that way they give you a bit more latitude. Cancer anniversaries, that might be an anniversary of diagnosis. It might be the anniversary of a, of a particular treatment starting or ending. Um, and of course, anniversaries, the nature of them is that they happen once a year. Diagnosis or death of a loved one, um, and not just from blood cancer. So it might be from any cancer. It might be from any other reason. So just the idea of being mortal and the fact that things can, in fact, take your life. By virtue of the work that I do, um, I do lose a proportion of my clients. And I got back from a holiday this week and one of the messages was from the wife of a, a guy that I've been treating for about eight years. And he had very slow growing cancer. And in the end, it fired up very quickly and he passed away with about in a, in a period of about five weeks, which was kind of the period that I was away. And I was so sad for losing him, but I was also really triggered myself. And both my husband and I were like, you know, it sort of took our breath away a bit. And I said, oh, God, it just, oh, it's doing it to me now. Um, it just reminds you, you know, this stuff can take people's lives, could take my life. And it's very scary. So when you have someone that you know, especially someone that's close to you, that's just touched your life, it, you know, it really pricks that mortal part of us. Media stories. I do a lot of work around breast cancer. And um, when Libby Newton-John died last year, that was a huge trigger. I can imagine it may have even been a trigger for people with blood cancer for the same reasons I've outlined is that it's just that idea that, you know, cancer ultimately can take someone's life and it can take someone's life after a long time. So it's not like, you know, she was diagnosed a long time ago. And, and some people said to me, oh, wasn't it great that she lived so long um, and that, you know, she didn't lose her life for such a long time. But other people said to me, yeah, do you know what it said to me? you're never safe. So I think, you know, you can look at it both ways, but it's a big trigger. And whenever we see things in the media, we might hear positive stories in the media, new treatments, new findings, research, grants, increased focus on mental health, might be all sorts of things. They might be good stories, but it can still act as a trigger. The biggest, and this would be no surprise to people, the biggest um, trigger for fear of cancer recurrence or fear of disease progression is physical symptoms born out in the research. It might be a physical symptom that, that is familiar. 
And so when people report, you know, what they were feeling or what symptoms might have led them to be investigated and be diagnosed in the first instance, if you have any of those symptoms, they seem to be particularly um, intense and sharp in terms of the anxiety response. And that makes sense because often it's that's that idea of like, well, I was feeling incredibly fatigued when I was diagnosed and now I'm feeling incredibly fatigued. So, you know, what does that say? But sometimes the physical symptom might have nothing to do ostensibly with not like sort of logically nothing to do with blood cancer or the cancer that you were diagnosed with. That that doesn't matter. It doesn't have to make sense. You know, somebody can get a rash or sorry if you're seeing my dog walk around behind me. Um, <laughs> Um, you can have any sort of physical symptom. So sometimes you might think, oh, God, why am I worrying about, you know, this particular issue that's never cropped up before that doesn't seem to be in the literature related to my blood cancer? It's just the idea of not being able to trust our body and the idea that something isn't working again and when it wasn't working last time, things went really pear-shaped. So when you look at the fact that there are that many triggers it's not hard to imagine that across one year, in any one year of your life, you're probably going to be triggered quite a few times, yeah? That's what it might look like. That might be the year of your life, a year of your life. So you might have a number of triggers, some higher, some lower, and a break, sometimes a longer break, sometimes a shorter break. But if you go back to the six triggers and you go, okay, take diagnosis out of that because that's that happened once. But every other, the other five triggers, you're probably going to have at least one of those each year. All of us are going to know somebody who dies from something. All of us are going to read some or hear some media story. We're all going to have an, an anniversary. We're all going to have a physical symptom. We're all going to have a medical review. So even if you only had one, that's five. I reckon it's pretty easy to go. You could have two each. Well, that's 10. That's one trigger every five weeks. So this is where I start to introduce the idea that fear of cancer recurrence is something that we come to live with. <laughs> I can see someone's cat there. Um, that we come to live with. That we... I sort of think about it a bit like an uninvited guest to dinner. You know, it's like, well, I didn't ask you, but you're here now. So I'm I may as well get you to pull up a, ta a chair at the table and get, get to know you, understand what are my particular triggers, what are my responses, how does it make me feel, because this stuff isn't going away. Fear has a bad reputation. Yep, we talk about anxiety as a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's your internal burglar alarm. You're meant to have it operational. It's the thing that saves your life. If you're standing in the middle of the road and a semi-trailer is bearing down on you, what is going to save your life? What is going to be the thing that makes you step off onto the footpath? It's your fear. It's your anxiety system. It's your internal burglar alarm. So this is where I say we don't want to turn off fear of cancer occurrence because if what happens if you disable your burglar alarm? You make it easier for the burglars to get in and do something. So we don't want to turn off fear of recurrence. We want to get it into the normal range. Like I said, it's normal to have fear of recurrence and fear of disease progression. We just want it at a bearable level, at an adaptive level, at a level that's not debilitating. So if you feel like you've been receiving any kind of messages from medical team or other people, I've, I've had delightful clients adult children of delightful clients who've come into me and said, Sharla, I just want you to get rid of my mother's fear. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be a massive disappointment to you because that's just not what we do. We get to know the fear. We learn to make friends with the fear. We don't try and get rid of the fear. We want Goldilocks fear, not too much, not too little, just the right amount. So this is about an acceptance model versus a change model, yeah? In psychology, we, we work with models all the time. A change model is where you try and change something. And just like Jen said, you know, it's about recognising that some of this stuff is outside our control, you know? I can't, I can't control what's going on with my cells. If one of them wants to do something weird and mutate and replicate, well, I can't stop that. So it's better to focus on the stuff I can. 
accepting that just like we were diagnosed and had a treatment protocol and may well have more is a much healthier mindset than struggling to try to change something we can't because what that sets up is this thing called resistance and so it's like we're trying we're in a push me pull you tug of war situation where we're going to not be the one with the control if we set up our expectations that you know I'm going to be able to combat this get rid of this beat this change this and then we can't the risk is that we feel failure and that's more negative stuff on top of a really hard situation already so again it's that idea of like look I didn't ask you to be part of my life you know I didn't want the cancer diagnosis in the first part but I got that and I got fear of recurrence fear of disease progression pull up a chair join me at my table let me get to know you The impact on relationships of fear of recurrence, going back to what I said earlier, principally comes around um, the the gaps in communication and the fact that our loved ones often, because they haven't haven't had the lived experience, cannot understand, not through any fault of their own, but just because they haven't lived it, they cannot understand what I call the visceral experience of fear of cancer occurrence or fear of disease progression. For me, it's like it gets me in my gut. And like I said, my husband, Rob, is a clinical psych and he gets it as close as I think anyone can, but he knows and I know that there's still a gap there where he, he can't feel what that's like to feel like you're in fear for your life. And so that gap in lived experience means that there is a gap often in the people who love us the most. And this is where I say sometimes it can be really helpful to make sure that you are accessing empathy from others who perhaps do have more of that lived experience because if you're able to extract empathy from somewhere else, it means that your expectations of your loved ones for that empathy may reduce. And that might take the pressure off those relationships a bit. The other thing is that talking about fear of recurrence and educating your loved ones about fear of recurrence and how it is a thing and it isn't going to go away and we are are all going to be living with this for the rest of time um, can actually be really helpful because if they have an expectation that we're going to change it or get rid of it, and they never see that happen, that has the potential for them to feel kind of, you know, frustrated and maybe not, um, again, not really understand your experience, but perhaps even judge or blame you for not for not being able to move on from this. Whereas bringing them into the circle and getting their understanding increased can be really helpful. I've got about seven strategies I'm going to work through with you now just in terms of what might help. And they won't all help. Some of these will be helpful for some of you. And um, I'm very used to, I I probably throw out about 800 strategies a day and I'm very used to most of them landing on my consulting room floor, but some of them do help. So we'll try. Number one, this is a really nice proactive strategy. And this is what I call the four pillars of coping. So this is paying attention to the four things that we absolutely know help all of us all the time. None of this is rocket science. Most of you will be familiar with things like the benefits of exercise, nutrition, sleep. I'm just going to pause there because I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about enjoyable activities. Exercise, nutrition and sleep are going to help your physical well-being and they're going to help your psychological well-being. Around fear of recurrence, if your physical well-being is better, your risk of recurrence will be lower and therefore your fear of recurrence will be lower. So if you feel like I'm the healthiest I can be, I feel more resilient, I feel less vulnerable physically, your fear of something bad happening physically will be lower. So there's a a twofold benefit to exercise, nutrition and sleep. Enjoyable activities is really individual. So what's going to be enjoyable for me isn't necessarily going to be enjoyable for anybody else. And some of this can be tricky. It's it, it's like, you know, you've got to work it out for yourself. And it can also be impacted by um, 
limitations around treatment, treatment side effects, the legacy of, of cancer treatment. So sometimes, you know, the things that we enjoy, we might not always be able to do. I love gardening, but I can't garden now for long stretches at a time, but I've learned to modify that. And so now I'll do 45 minutes or an hour and then I'll have a break. Um, so sometimes it's about going, all right, I've got to identify the enjoyable activity, but not indulge the black and white thinking sometimes that we can have when when we can't do something the way we want to. Sometimes we go, oh, well, I won't do it at all. It can be about going, okay, I'm going to identify that thing I want to do and then find a way to do it in that fits within my, my current physical limitations. Um, enjoyable activities typically, you know, obviously are things that we, we like doing. Often the things we like doing are things that we are quite good at. You know, we're, we've got some mastery, we've got some skills and they often, they often are aligned with our values. So they're about what's important to us. And when we psychologically, the research book bears out that when we engage in things that match our values, psychologically, we do better. So that's one of the reasons I do this sort of thing why I do webinars and podcasts and, you know, present it at conferences and stuff is because it aligns with my values around giving back in the cancer space. And that helps me psychologically. So, you know, for some people, it will be, you know, a sensory activity. And I love sensory things, things that ignite one of our five senses. Our five senses are underutilized and they use different parts of our brain and they're fabulous because they keep us in the present. And so they can be incredibly helpful. If you are in the present, you can't be in the future worrying and you can't be in the past ruminating. You are likely to be in the present and extracting um, meaning and enjoyment from things that you are engaged with right here, right now. Second strategy. I really like this one and I've done it in therapy so many times and every time I do this, we get a different we get a different result. So this is about objectifying your fear. So think of your fear of recurrence, think of your fear of disease progression, and then think about it as an object. What color is it? What shape is it? Is it an organized shape? Is it a disorganized shape? What size is it, say, relative to the size of a house or the size of a car? How heavy is it? Is it solid? Is it liquid? Is it vapour? Can you see through it or not? What's its texture? If you ran your hand over it, would you feel a smooth surface or a spiky surface? And can you move it around? I've had all sorts of things. A green blob, a pink veil, um, a black plate. Everybody's got a different idea of what their fear looks like. The reason this strategy can be helpful is that if you can turn your fear into an object and see it in your mind's eye, it allows you a different perspective. It allows you to separate yourself from the fear. It allows you to set it aside, even for a moment. You know, that idea of like, well, I'll just pop that orange ball over there in my mind because it'll be there when I come back but I can separate myself and I can talk about it. I can see it. It's a thing. It's not me. I'm not consumed by it. It's something separate. That's my fear of recurrence. It's a fist, very small, dense, silver, heavy, smooth. And when I see that in my mind's eye, I can have distance from it. And when we get a bit of distance, that disempowers the fear. Third strategy. This is around the physical symptoms. So usually what happens when we identify a physical symptom, and this can be when we're doing a thing called body scanning, and body scanning is when our brain is kind of like keeping track of what's going on with our body, almost like, you know, when you take a photocopy of a page and there's that green line that sort of like goes across the page and then back again. Well, body scanning is kind of like that, where your brain uses the green line to just check what's going on with my body all the time. And when we identify a physical symptom, usually the first thought is the worst thought. And that thought is almost always, it's the cancer, it's back. And what I say to people is, we don't want to try and get rid of that thought 
because that can feel invalidating. What I encourage my clients to do is identify two alternative explanations for the same physical symptom. So, for example, if I get a headache, in a nanosecond, I can convince myself that I have brain mets, which is something that can happen with breast cancer. And then I say to myself, all right, let yourself have that, that one thought because it, it could be brain mets. I don't know. The only person who could tell me is my doctor and probably only with a scan. So I let myself have that one explanation. And then I go, what are two other explanations for my headache? One is probably that I'm dehydrated because I just never, ever drink enough fluid. And the second is I'm probably a bit tired and a bit stressed. And what that does by coming up with three explanations for the same symptom, if you like, it spreads the fear. So I think about it like having 100 fear eggs. And if I put 100 eggs in one fear basket, which is its brain mets, boy, that's putting all those eggs in one basket. That feels heavy and scary. But if I spread those 100 fear eggs across three baskets, so one is brain mets, one is dehydration, and one is tired and stressed, then it dilutes the fear. And what it does also is it, is it engages my rational mind. We all have two minds. We have our emotional mind and our wise mind. Our emotional mind, which is normal, is the anxiety, is the fear. Our rational mind is when we think about things using, using information, um, good, good quality information. So when we, when we expand our thinking to identify two alternative symptoms, what we are doing is we are engaging our rational mind and that has the effect of bringing the anxiety down. What I then say to people is, before I go on to number four, um, is I want you to monitor any symptom sensibly. So it's not about dismissing the symptom. It's not about saying, don't worry about that symptom. It is about thinking, okay, I need to keep an eye on that. And usually over days to a week or two, most of our medical team will say, if something's happened and it's not settling down in a week or two, you need to let me know. And it depends obviously on the severity and in your particular situation. So it's not about dismissing the symptom. It is about expanding your mind around the explanations, the possible explanations for the symptom. If you can't get rid of something, can you use it to be useful? So I will quite often, and I do this myself, use my fear as a motivator to engage in healthy lifestyle behaviours and to live consistent with my redefined values after a cancer diagnosis. So for me, it's us this stuff is usually around exercise and sleep. My sleep really um, is my Achilles heel. And so if my sleep goes off the boil, everything else kind of does too. And so I know that if I, if I keep an eye on my sleep, I will do better. And I've learned that exercise is my silver bullet. So on the days, and this is most days, when I don't feel like exercising, if I need to, I can tap into my fear of recurrence. Because if I can identify that, that um, the, the anxiety is going to be reduced by increasing my exercise and my fitness, then that works effectively as a motivator. And in terms of not just healthy lifestyle behaviours, but to do the things that I want to do. You know, after a cancer diagnosis, and I think Jen referenced this, it, it, you know, it, it can be really scary to invest in life because you do feel like, well, I'm setting myself up again, making myself vulnerable. But if we do that, the risk is that we let cancer take away even more. So doing the stuff that I want to do and doing it now and not waiting, saying the things that matter, making sure that, you know, if I look back next week on this week that I go, yeah, there's some stuff in there that I did that I wanted to do, stuff that mattered. Number five, dealing with intrusive thoughts. So intrusive thoughts are called intrusive thoughts because that's what they do. They intrude. And one of the hardest things to deal with psychologically is intrusive thoughts. And what you may find when you're triggered around fear of recurrence and fear of disease progression is that intrusive thoughts will really fire up and it will be very hard to step away from them. Trying to distract yourself or not think about the thought is largely um, ineffective. So for example, if I said to you, there's a pink elephant in the corner of the room and I don't want you to think about the pink elephant, what are you going to think about? 
the pink elephant and even trying not to think about the pink elephant is in fact thinking about the pink elephant. So trying not to think about something doesn't really work. So sometimes the more helpful strategy is to acknowledge the intrusive thought, to say, gosh, I am having some intrusive thoughts and today they are out of control or gosh, just had an hour without an intrusive thought. That happened to me this morning because I had some intrusive thoughts yesterday about a sticky situation and I got in the shower this morning and I thought, oh, haven't had one yet. It's been a few hours and that was really nice. So being able to acknowledge it and just, you know, say that's happening or not happening. Um, try and identify the thought, try and nail it down. When we think about, you know, most of us are pretty comfortable talking about our behaviours and our feelings. You know, I feel sad or I'm crying a lot or shouting a lot. But when I say to my client, can you tell me what the thought is? That's quite hard to do. Thoughts are often not long. So it might be a phrase. It might be like, you know, that pain in my leg is really, it's really bothering me. It might be that the intrusive thought is a, a visual image of being back in the hospital, back away from loved ones, back alone and isolated. But trying to identify it and isolate it can be really helpful, partly so that you can work with it, but also so that then you can describe that to another person. It's staggering how helpful it is once you can articulate a, a problem, once you can identify it. And the other thing that you can do, and this is the weird thing about you can't control the thoughts that come, but you can control whether you engage with it or not. So when an intrusive thought pops into your head, that's the bit you can't control. But if you can see it, if you can identify it, if you can label it, you name it, you can decide, am I going to dance with you? Am I going to engage with you? Or am I going to let you go? Let you go now because you'll be back because you've been back a few times, but I've got other things to do now. Just like naming the thought, naming the feeling can be really good. And this is helpful, particularly in interactions with others, with loved ones and family members, because like I said before, fear of recurrence and honestly, most emotional and psychological responses are invisible. So Charlotte, who is angry, doesn't look very different to Charlotte, who is sad to Charlotte who is bored to Charlotte who is lonely I look about the same maybe some subtle differences but if people aren't really tuned in they're not going to be able to pick it but being able to say how you feel can be incredibly helpful to relationships and it can also help you move on more quickly from how you're feeling there's a wheel of emotions there and this is not hard to find. If you pop wheel of emotions into Google, you will find this or something similar. The central circle is the classifications and then there are more emotions that are listed in the outside circle. But just being able to identify exactly how you're feeling can be really helpful. Quite often when we're feeling upset, we will say, I'm feeling upset, or I'm feeling distressed, but we don't necessarily go a bit deeper to go, okay, well, what, what is the feeling? You know, I'm feeling... I'm feeling guilty or I'm feeling ashamed or I'm feeling rage or I'm feeling gratitude. But digging down and figuring out what it is, like I said, good for communication, good for identifying, good for moving on from. Last strategy, learning to trust your body again is hard. There are two things that help. One is time. And the other one is that when you have something that you notice like a physical symptom and you let it unfold or it does unfold and nothing sinister happens, what I ask people to do is to pay attention to that, to notice that they were scared, that their brain made a prediction. That's what anxiety does. It makes a prediction made a prediction that something bad was going to happen and that it didn't. And when we close out that loop and we go, okay, my anxiety made a prediction and it didn't happen, and then that's happened once, twice, hopefully many times, each time we make a prediction and then it doesn't happen, our anxiety reduces just a little bit. Now, it isn't 
probably ever going to get to the stage for anybody with a blood cancer history that they're going to completely trust their body. And that's where I go back to that's completely normal and actually completely what we would want. We want a certain level of vigilance, but not trusting your body at all is also not what we want. And that's the end of my presentation. Wow, aren't we very lucky to have had you, Charlotte, and you, Jen, together here with us this morning such wonderful insights and I love that you've brought that you know the the Goldilocks fear and the acknowledgement that fear is normal and how you've given us some strategies and how you've you know drawn out all of those vulnerabilities that we are all vulnerable human beings um, accessing um, empathy um, normalizes or you know helps people cope better so I just really value some lovely golden nuggets that you've been able to um, share with us here this morning and how that connects with Jen's session as well uh, I'd like to now um, um, pass the microphone over to my colleague Jen for the pre-submitted questions and answers so um, I know that the chat has been very active. So um, over to you, Jen, for some Q&A. I think more valuable time needs to be spent with these lovely women. Oh, thanks for that. Um, the chat has been going off like a frog in a sock, which is always a sign that people are really engaged. And there's a lot of thanks in there for both um, you, Charlotte and Jen. Um, really, it's been really, really helpful. I'm gonna start with an easy one. Um, uh, Tony asked, how do you manage intrusive thoughts at night time? Charlotte, I think this is a good one. We all know you're lying in bed, it's dark. There's nothing to engage those senses that you talked about. And that's when that little fear monster can, can rear up. So have you got any suggestions around that? Yes, um, there's certainly plenty of evidence that nighttime is a particularly um, tricky one for all of us, uh, truthfully for the human race, um, about intrusive thoughts. I think there's something about um, there's no distractions, um, there's, there's silence, there's not even that... Um, that with with the daylight you can see things that will that will distract your mind and give you opportunities to kind of like engage with other thoughts so and I, I certainly know from my own experience that I'm capable of catastrophizing something quite mild in the middle of the night and then I wake up at sort of six in the morning with the with the sunlight or the daylight and think what was that about because it doesn't seem nearly so catastrophic um in the morning um, the first thing I would say is to do what I said about intrusive thoughts generally, and that is to identify it and to see if you can, you know, drill down and actually um, isolate it as a specific thought. I keep a small um, notebook or a pad and a pen next to my bed. And whilst I don't turn the light on, because if you turn the light on and you sit up, you're probably going to you know, completely wake up. Although if you're awake enough to have an intrusive thought, maybe it doesn't make any difference anyway. What I often will do is if I'm having a, re a recurring intrusive thought is I'll write it down. Um, there's something about sometimes the, the human brain, it's almost like keeping a tennis ball up in the air. And I think sometimes when we write down the intrusive thought, it's almost like, again, it's that separation. I'm setting it aside. I, I can deal with it if it's important tomorrow or never. And I've woken up many mornings to some hieroglyphics on the on the pad next to the bed and gone, I've no idea actually what that is, but it obviously was important in the middle of the night. So I think identifying it, isolating it, maybe writing it down can be helpful. Again, it's that idea of like, if you spend a whole lot of time trying to get rid of it, it often has the, the opposite effect. So it's more like sometimes sort of relaxing into it. The other thing is that if you notice that it's a worry, so if it's a worry thought, there's a very helpful um, diagram, which you'll be able to find on the internet. It's called the worry tree. And essentially it looks like a um, line drawing of a Christmas tree. And at the top, it says, identify the worry and then ask yourself, can I do something about it? And it's a yes, no answer. So can I do something about it? So if my worry, so I'm not trying to be um, in any way dismissive here, but let's just go with a, a, a very mild example. If my worry is I've got 10 people coming to dinner on Saturday night and I've got eight chairs, my worry is like, what, what are they going to sit on, the other two people? Can I do something about that? The answer to that is yes, I can. So then it's about making a plan 
and executing the plan later? If the answer is I can't do anything about it because we don't have any more chairs and they're just going to have to sit on the floor, then I can't do anything about it. So it's about recognising that I can't do anything about it and setting the worry aside, consciously making that decision about it's a worry, can I do something about it or not, yes or no. If it's yes, make a plan. If it's no, set the worry aside. Now, that sounds simple, that set the worry aside thing, but actually consciously going, well, I can't do anything about it. So I am going to set that worry aside can be really helpful. So the worry tree is a good one. Thanks. That's brilliant. I think there's a lot of a lot of questions were submitted and um, you've you've covered a lot, but I think it'd be good to go over some things. So a lovely person wrote in and said, not knowing when it will come back is like the sword of Damocles hanging over my head. Yes. And it was such a powerful image and I think the, the a question came in that really relates to this which is how do people nurture their hope for their future even when they feel that the treatments they've had may have had limited or no success so how do you how do you get that balancing act um, it's quite a fine a fine line you know tipping to that adaptive versus maladaptive sort of behaviors that you were mentioning earlier but have you got any other thoughts around that and then I'll I'll go to Jen to see if she's got any thoughts about what she does um hope is so important um I was asked a few years ago to speak with ovarian cancer about the about the importance of hope and whenever I'm asked to speak I never want to get caught with my pants down so I went and did a bit of research around hope and um I mean, not, not that it was news to me, but it was good to do a refresher. And essentially hope is why we get out of bed in the morning. You know, without hope, any of us, there's kind of no point to life. And one of the big watchwords in psychology, there's two big watchwords in psychology. One is hopelessness and the other one is helplessness. And so being hopeless is a big deal. So we don't want to get into a space where we are hopeless. I think that... Um, when we put it into a blood cancer context, sometimes it's about um, being able to live very much in that present space or in a space where we're not, um, whilst we've got a future focus, it's a future focus where it feels like um, I'm looking forward maybe in three or six or 12 month increments rather than worrying about really long-term stuff. Because if we start to engage in that really long-term thinking, that can feel very um, hopeless. It can feel like, you know, that my chances of having that long life might be less than I ever imagined. Whereas if we're looking at things in three, six, 12 month bites, that feels more consistent with a, you know, present hopeful way of living. Thanks, Charlotte. Jen, do you have any anything you'd like to add about hope? Um, well, I mean, I think Charlotte said it a lot more <laughs> poignantly than I could have. Um, however, for me, obviously, I, I've been through the hopeless headspace before. It's not ideal. Um, for me, finding a purpose has given me hope. So as I said, when I was talking is that the being able to have children and a family was taken away very early on. And I did, that's probably been the hardest part for me to grapple with over the years, but um, giving myself a different purpose. So focusing myself on getting pets and having the pets as my children has really given me hope and given me a reason to get up in the morning, a reason to want to push on. Like I've had, I've had the, after the last time I relapsed, I, I um, have to admit that I had had a conversation with my doctor saying, I don't want to go through this again. Like this is the last time. Um, but since then I've, I went through the treatment. It was fine. I mean, it was fine. This was going to be, but then I've, I've gotten a dog and I've gotten a cat and I've gotten my own apartment and that's given me a purpose to get up in the morning. So I'm fine to keep tracking on with how my life's going with the illness because, well, I mean, that's what the animals have to be there for them. So I want to be there for them. So that's where my hope comes from. So make sure you have a purpose, whatever that is. Uh, and don't think that your illness has taken away your purpose or has defined your life because it hasn't. You're, you're, you're the only person that can define your life. You're the only person that can give you hope. That's a beautiful response. Um, thank you. And I think it comes back to a question that someone else asked. Um, and, it, and it relates to relationships, um, Charlotte, and that 
that idea that that fear of recurrence isn't just yours alone it, it comes with your families and friends and that interaction between the two and and someone sort of uh, mentioned that they would really love to have a relationship and children as part of their future and how do they fully invest in life knowing that that cancer could return and the impact will then be on other people they might be quite prepared to deal with the impact on themselves but what that sense they're putting other people and particularly children through that what what would your suggestions be around that Yes, this is tricky territory um, and and it's particularly tricky for uh, younger people who may have been diagnosed at a point in their life where they hadn't yet partnered up, hadn't yet had the, the um, opportunity or the thoughts around things like um, raising a family. Um, and there's a lot of apprehension about like, partly about how do I even begin, when do I tell someone, how might they react, the idea of being rejected because, um, you know, I might be seen as damaged goods or not, not that someone's not prepared to make the investment. You know, it's one thing if you're already in a committed relationship and you've already done the kind of like in sickness and in health thing, but if you haven't got there yet, the idea of like, well, will, will someone take me on with with all of my health stuff is a very scary thought. Um I mentioned watchwords before. Two of my watchwords are authenticity and transparency. And whilst I want to acknowledge, you know, absolutely this, this is scary territory and being vulnerable in relationships is really hard for humans. I encourage people to get stuff out on the table early, um, to, to be vulnerable, to take emotional risks, again, for the same reason as I highlighted earlier, in that if we live a life that is constrained by fear and by lack of hope, then we are letting cancer take away even more than it already has. And that just doesn't feel right. Now, you know, obviously, not every foray into a relationship is going to go well and that's the truth whether it's got anything to do with cancer or not you know lots and lots of relationships don't make it but I think if we if we allow the cancer to make the prediction and we follow the prediction that you know I will not I will not partner up or I will be rejected or this will be too much for someone else then we're maybe not giving we're maybe not giving someone the chance to love us and we're, we're maybe you know if, prejudging someone I mean I'm I'm still in awe of how much my husband you know has done and continues to do with and for me generally but around the cancer stuff um you know my body's broken I my sex life is in not my sex my sex drive is in the toilet um there's lots of reasons that you know I would be expecting to be rejected and I'm not and if I let my anxiety predict that, then I would withdraw and that would cause a problem. So I think sometimes it is about, it is about like just when you're feeling your most vulnerable, it's about, you know, taking another risk. But some of those risks are going to pay off really handsomely. Yeah, it really sounds like unless you give people the chance to step in and step up, um, you're denying yourself the opportunity for support as well. In exactly. Some ways. Yeah, Janet, would you like to comment on that? Because I think, you know, you've got a lot of experience in this area. Yeah, look, I definitely have this. This is probably where I can speak the most to, whether it be positive or negative. I'm, I'm still navigating this myself, if I'm being honest. Um, initially, being so young, I I was very much of the thought, well, who's going to want me now? Um, what, when, why would anyone want to go on this journey with me? This is a life thing. This is too much for anyone to take on. I'm not worth it, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then I got a bit older. Um, obviously I had some rejection as a result of it, but the older I got, the more I figured, why would I want someone it, putting the cancer aside? Why would I want to be with someone who would be that kind of person anyway, if you're not giving me a chance and you're solely clearing the table of me based on uh, something I can't help. I mean, that says more about you than about me. One strategy, which I think a lot of people gasp at when I say it, but for me, the last time around, um, post transplant I was bald I was like I just want to get out there and meet somebody so I put bald pictures of me on my tinder account no hair no eyebrows hot mess <laughs> but um the the quality of human beings I attracted was through the roof comparatively to anything in even pre-cancer that I'd attracted before and the people that 
that I guess look at the fact that okay yeah she's missing hair and she's got cancer and it's a life cancer but hey look how strong she is putting it out there look how look how you wouldn't if it wasn't for the fact she didn't have any hair you wouldn't know she didn't have cancer because she's still grabbing life by the balls sorry my part of my language <laughs> um so I just think yeah I think it's about not only giving yourself um leeway but it's also giving other humanity leeway because I think it's not fair to assume that no one's going to want to um you're just putting your values on someone else and that's not fair so be kinder to yourself is my main I mean, be kinder to yourself because most people are going to be kinder to you as well. People well, that are worth your time. So. I sometimes think too, people um, self-select, as you said, if you put that out there and they run for the hills, thank you. The trash yeah, is absolutely. taking itself out. That's absolutely. fantastic. So yeah, that's great. And I'm that's also a really much. great example of that authenticity and transparency. It's like, you know, I, I am different. I am dealing with some big stuff. I'm not going to pretend that I'm not. I'm not, I'm not like everybody else. And that's really, that's, that's cool. That's who I am. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think for me, and I can't speak to every, everyone who's had cancer, but for me, I'm certainly a much better human being. I'm much happier with myself since the cancer because of what I've seen that I've been able to accomplish and achieve to this date. Um, so why focus on the fact that it's the cancer that got me here? The fact is I'm here. It doesn't matter if the cancer is what got me here. I am here. I'm a better person now. You're dating me. You're not dating the cancer. Give them a chance yeah. to feel the same way. Yeah. You are not your cancer. You are someone who has yeah. an experience yeah. of cancer. Right? Absolutely. I'm going to shift gears a bit now. I think there's a, a lot of people in the blood cancer community that have conditions like CLL, MDS, MPN, where there's no real active treatment at that time of diagnosis, even though they might require some down the track or in the future. So for, for people in that category of watch and wait, they often feel even quite isolated in the blood cancer community because they haven't got that shared experience of treatment and it's hard to explain to friends and things. So what suggestions would you have for, for managing worry around that particular curious scenario, Charlotte, where they've got something but people don't think it's a problem because they're not having treatment so therefore it can't be real. It's a real conundrum. Yes, and it sets up um, probably a, a higher level of what I call emotional isolation than um, than is standard. If if you are more fitting the 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 standard stereotype, if you like, of someone who's been diagnosed and having treatment or is dealing with an ongoing chronic situation, then um, you're in a you're in a a pond with more people and more people who get it. But yeah, that idea that you're kind of still probably living your life you know you're probably working or living the way that you always have you probably don't look sick um very few people have a sophisticated understanding of the differences of of the different types of blood cancer and blood disorders um never mind the fact that there can be these ones that are just sort of smoldering or sitting there quietly in the background for a long time um in terms of dealing with the emotional isolation um a couple of things one is that through groups like the Chemia Foundation, finding and connecting with people who are in similar situations is incredibly valuable. And it might be one person, it might be a group of people, it might be online, it might be in person, it might be through text, it might be through voice, it doesn't matter, it's got to be kind of like what works for you. But that's where you get that that empathy. And I quite often say empathy is gold and go where you're understood. Because mm -hmm. when you get that, then, like I said before, it can mean that your expectations of the other people in your life is then a bit more reduced because you're not trying to extract from your loved ones who just don't get it. You're not trying to extract it and then being disappointed by them. And that's always tricky in relationships. Whereas if you feel like, okay, I've had my my dose of empathy this week or this month and I'm feeling I'm feeling better I'm feeling stronger I'm feeling more understood then I can go into the rest of my life and and be um be a bit easier to deal with probably so I think that would be that would be one thing the second thing is um again you know communication and it's so hard and particularly when you are dealing with a chronic situation you know like in an acute scenario where something's bad for a week or a month most of us can talk about it yep be like it's all out there but when it's a chronic thing we get we get fatigued we get bored 
we get uh, we make the assumption that we're a burden on others and we want to not be a burden and we also want to protect other people from from any fear or distress and so we tend to get quieter with time and so what I really encourage people to do is to push against that now that's not to say that you want to be talking about it all day every day but there does need to be a regular check-in and, and I do often say that to people who are dealing with that um smoldering watch and wait um long term nothing much going on situation is to take someone to each of your medical appointments when when it gets to a point where it's become pretty standard and you're kind of like you know nothing much to see here sometimes people go I'll just go by myself because you know don't really need to take anyone you probably don't need them to be there as the emotional support particularly if nothing much is happening but it can be really helpful for them to be there because it reminds them that we're still doing this. This is still a thing. You know, we're still seeing the consultant haematologist. We're still going into the hospital. We're still doing the blood tests. We're still, oh, this is still a thing. Oh, we're still there. Yeah, that's really helpful. So I think um, keeping it, you know, like front of mind in loved ones is really important. Thank you. There's another group of people that often feel quite isolated, and this is the um, the group of children and adolescents and young adult survivors of cancer. So, you know, they have sort of different and extended challenges. So they live quite a long time, but often in a body that's experiencing um, a lot of the long-term and side effects of cancer at a very young age when their bodies and their minds are still developing so are there any considerations that young adults need to make or any any different things we need to think about within that population that you can think of um I think that you know a lot of younger people who are diagnosed at a younger point fall into that outlier group that I mentioned before um so certainly recognising that for people who are both younger and, and outliers, the chances that they will experience fear of recurrence and possibly at higher levels or um, more frequently needs to be recognised and that um, opportunities for support in that space, whether it's um, talking to their GP, to someone like me, or to going to support groups through things like Leukemia Foundation, I think making sure that you know there is recognition and that so there's some scaffolding for them is really important. The other thing I will say, and I'm I'm just being cautious here because this will not apply to everybody, but. One of the things that we do see with, with much younger people, and I'm not talking about Jen's young age because I'm 50, ugh, I just turned 59, but um, so Jen's very young compared to me, but I'm talking about like young, young, so like teenagers or even, you know, even younger. One of the things that we do see psychologically is that people who are diagnosed very young are perversely okay psychologically they do really well with this stuff and part of that is often because it happens when their brain is developing and um, it becomes sort of their normal and there's a often a high degree of support around them their brain development means that and this isn't in any way meant to be derogatory their brain development means that they're literally not able to really conceptualize or understand the true implications of everything they're going through I mean a, a fully um fully developed adult male brain is at about 28 years of age. So if you're diagnosed when you're at 15, you're only halfway there. And uh, that's not meant to be in any way derogatory. That's just the truth. So it means that, you know, your brain isn't really able to get what's going on. And that is quite protective. So there will be some young people who actually probably do surprisingly well. And, and the adults around them may find that quite odd. And I certainly have parents who will ring me and go, what's going on? My, my child's fine. And I'm like, yeah, I know. It's great. And it's, it's adaptive because if you think that in a family, if everybody collapsed all at once, well, the human race wouldn't survive. You know, sometimes some, some of us have got to be okay so that the other ones can be not okay. So sometimes there needs to be recognition and scaffolding. Sometimes there it will be surprisingly okay. Thank you. That that explains a lot, I think. I I want to finish on one last question, um, which was a real ripper, and I hadn't thought about this. Someone asked, how do you best deal with pity 
I might go to <laughs> Jen first on that one. Ah, uh, try and word this without swearing or being rude because pity is something that I personally, I hate it, I hate it. It comes from a good place. So I try not to be angry at the person, but I think if you can, as we've been talking about this whole, this whole uh, meeting is communication for me. So I, I'm also very much like Charlotte in that authenticity and communication. I, I live by it. In fact, I, sometimes I feel like a broken record, how much I talk about things, but I encourage it because I think I think if people understand, for me, I, I make sure all my friends and my peers really, really understand how I am in my head and with the illness at all stages, whether I be in remission for 10 years or not, keep the communication open because they see that I'm openly communicating with you. I'm going to tell you blatantly if I'm not doing a good job. If I'm, if I'm in a bad place, I'll call my boss and I'll be like mental health day today. And then I feel like the overt oh poor Jen or oh, oh she's having a good time doesn't really happen because the lines of communication open they're not assuming how I'm feeling I'm telling them how I'm feeling if I'm feeling really bad I want to tell them I'm feeling bad and I want to tell them I'm going to take these steps to feel better and you need to give me the time to take these steps to feel better and then you don't get that pity that can sometimes feel really condescending or make you feel belittled or make you feel crap about yourself because you're telling them how you feel if you're not feeling well, you're going to tell them that you're not feeling well and you're going to tell them the steps you're going to take to feel better and what you need from them. So personally, that's how I deal with pity. I don't let people pity me. If I'm feeling crap, just be honest about how you're feeling crap and how you're going to deal with it um, and how what you need from them to help you deal with it. I think I rambled on there, but I hope that makes sense. No, it was brilliant. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> Charlotte, is there any comment you'd like to make to round that out? Yeah, I think Jen's highlighted the distinction between understanding and pity. So when people understand what's going on with you, they probably won't pity you because they'll be busy understanding you. So that's great. <laughs> um, it reminds me of a delightful client, young client, who I saw a few years ago and she she has passed away, but um, she was having a big, she had pity too. In fact, I'm not, I've not met anyone who likes pity. I don't think any of us <laughs> like pity. It's a disgusting thing. Um, I'm yet to work out the point of it. Because usually there's a point to most things that have persisted over time, but I've worked out the point of pity anyway. Maybe it's to bring us all together to hate it. Um, but anyway, this this client was having a very big sort of girls' lunch um, to sort of celebrate her life, and she was apprehensive about it. And she said to me, um, "I just I can't bear it. I can't bear the pity." So we got a big bucket and we put a. a a label pity on it and we sat the bucket at the front door and we said when people arrive we said right pop your pity in there there's no pity allowed and it was great and what that really is is communication mm. it's just it was just another way it was using a visual cue to be able to say to people there's no place for pity here um Jen's right pity often does come from a good place it misplaced um, and I think that maybe the reason that we really don't like pity is probably we perceive it as judgment. It's somebody observing me and my situation without enough information. They're not communicating or asking or understanding. They're standing back making assumptions and then placing their judgment, their pity on me, and none of us like being judged. So... Um, as Jen has highlighted, high level of communication that generates understanding and that reduces the idea or the, the um, presence of pity. Brilliant. You guys have been utterly superb. I've just enjoyed every minute. I'm sure everyone on the, on the line would be happy to sit here for another hour and we could just talk about this forever. But there's lots of love in the chat for both of you and what you shared with us today. So thank you so, so much. Back to Marianne. Yes, thank you, girls, very, very much. I too have witnessed the love in the chat and um, love the key, the key messages that you've shared with us. You know, the importance of connection, the importance of purpose, a good mindset, um, good communication, and many, many more. Um, we've had a, an incredible amount of valuable information shared. Um, this does draw our webinar to a close. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank 
the supporters of the Leukaemia Foundation, um, as without them, we would not be able to deliver the education events like this. Um, all of our guest speakers, we thank you for generously sharing your knowledge, expertise, and time with us here today. And most importantly, all of you here living with blood cancer who have joined us on the line here today. We encourage you to use this information and to start conversations with your healthcare team to reach out to us blood cancer support coordinators, uh, your fam family, friends, to help guide you with your health, recovery and quality of life. Just also to let you know, um, if you have any questions or concerns, we encourage you to check out our resources on our website, um, www.leukemia.org.au, or you can call us and chat to us on 1800 620 420 and speak to someone in person. Uh, we have a team of blood cancer support coordinators here to help. Um, we offer emotional support and can refer you to um, services within or outside the Leukaemia Foundation. Um, we have um, a lot of connections and a lot of resources. We also have programs available to help access exercise, assist in return to workspace and many, many other things. Um, a short feedback email you'll all receive in your email box, possibly tomorrow. Um, if you can complete, please consider um, completing this because we always love to hear your thoughts um, so we can bring you more of what you like to hear and you know what you need to know. Um, I'd also like to remind you that a recording of this webinar will be available in two weeks um, on our website on our YouTube channel. For those of you here who have registered, you'll receive um, that recording to your email. Um, thank you again for joining us. And thank you again, Charlotte and Jen, for joining us here this morning. This morning, it's been absolutely fantastic. All the very best to all of you and goodbye.